Good morning, church. Good morning. Lindsay and I are so glad to be back. You were all so extremely kind and welcoming to us two months ago when we were here. Uh, so thank you for uh, inviting us back to worship God with you. It's so great to be here. Well, today is Super Bowl Sunday. Any Panthers fans here? All right. We're big Panthers fans. So I want to tell you a story about a man that really loved football. Steve grew up in Dallas, Texas, and was naturally a Cowboys fan, just like everyone else who lives in Texas. He was able to attend almost every single home game with his father growing up. And after graduating from college, Steve took a job in Boston, Massachusetts, almost 2,000 miles away from his beloved Cowboys. Now, he thought he would be able to settle for watching the Cowboys on TV, but it just wasn't the same. Steve chose to take a four-hour flight back to Dallas for every home game. Now, he spent at least $600 round trip every single home game. Now, that doesn't include the $18,000 he spent on season tickets every year. Now, Steve was making decent money at his Boston job, but he couldn't afford a nice house, a nice car, a nice everything, plus live this extravagant football lifestyle. And so Steve made some sacrifices. He sold his car and used public transportation. He moved out of his 2,500 square feet house and moved into a 750 square feet apartment. And he lived off of ramen noodles, <laughs> which is never a good idea. Now, if you ask Steve why he gave up so much, he would tell you it's because he loved the Dallas Cowboys. Let me ask you a question about Steve. How do you know that he loves the Cowboys? Is it simply because he said, I love the Dallas Cowboys? Of course not. As we can clearly see in his story, Steve's love was demonstrated by his actions. And likewise, and even more so, God has an unending, unconditional, unchanging love for you. But how do you know he loves you? If you have your Bible with you, Please turn to the book of 1 John, found near the very back of the Bible, just a few books before Revelation. We will look at the Bible's answer to the question of God's love. And we will also find out what we are supposed to do as a response to that amazing love. You can follow along with me as I read chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, 
God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can gather together this morning to worship you. You are entirely worthy of all of our worship. God, we, we ask now that you would send your Holy Spirit to give, give us eyes to see and ears to hear from you as we look into your word. God, I pray that you would be pleased to use me in all my weaknesses and imperfections and, and use me, God, to, to grow a deep love for Christ and for one another in my brothers and sisters before me now. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. Did anybody notice that I repeated a certain word over and over again in that passage? The word love, whether used as a noun or a verb, was used 13 times, 15 times if you count the term beloved that Paul uses, of, that John uses of the church. So it's safe to say that this passage has something to do with love. And in these few verses, it's very evident that God defines love, God reveals love, and God perfects love. And since the term love is used so often, it would be most helpful to understand what this term actually means. And so let's look first at how God defines love. In verse 7, you will find the key or the main point of this passage. And the main point is that John wants the church to love one another because God is love. In other words, he wants you, Macon Baptist, to know the love of God for a purpose. And that purpose is to lead you to love one another. The term one another is equated in this verse with those who have been born of God and know God. And to help shed some light on this idea of being born of God, listen to what John says in his gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This helps us to see who are the children of God. Of God, Who are those that are born of God? It is those who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Are you born of God? Have you trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior? To be forgiven of all your sins and reconciled to God. Do you know God? Not, not just about God, but do you know him intimately? Is he your greatest treasure? Is he your highest delight? I hope you do. If you are born of God, 1 John 4, 7 stresses that you are to love other Christians. It also shows us that loving one another is a sure sign that somebody is born of God. It's evidence. In verse 8, it's actually saying the exact same thing just in the inverse. It explains that those who do not love have not been born of God and therefore don't know God. And now it gets very interesting in verse 8 because it explains that those who do not, do not love God don't know God because God is love. God is love is a statement about who God is. It's about his very nature, the, at the core of who he is. In John 17, 24, Jesus says that the Father loved him before the creation of the world. So the love of God is not something that is dependent upon creation. This means that God defines love not the other way around. Who God is and what God does are the definition of love. 
Now, the word that John uses for love is agape. And this word agape says that I love you even when you are not lovable. It is love that extends to both the deserving and to the undeserving. This verse explains that God continually is giving of himself to others and is constantly seeking the welfare and benefit of others, even if they aren't deserving of it. And then in verses 9 and 10, we see that God seeks the best for others, even at great cost to himself. So God's love is giving, and it's sacrificial. Now let's look next at how God reveals love. Verse 9 couldn't be any more explicit about the description of the love of God. John says this, In this way, the love of God becomes clear and obvious to us that God sent his Son into the world. God's love is giving and is sacrificial. God gave his Son to be a sacrifice on our behalf so that we could have eternal life instead of eternal hell. And this is so extremely important to understand that John even repeats himself almost word for word in verse 10. And he adds the fact that God's love for us isn't dependent upon our love for him. So he isn't simply responding to us in love because we have love for him. That would be easy. But in fact, we were enemies of God. We were haters of God. We were rebels against God. Put simply, we were not lovable. But God still loved us. The love of God is so gracious, merciful, compassionate, and conditional. He loves us simply because he chose to. John then, John then explains in verse 10 how we can have life through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to point out that long, five-syllable word that nobody actually uses in daily conversation. If you're reading the King James Version or the English Standard Version, that word is propitiation. Um, the New International Version, some other modern translations, use the word uh, atoning sacrifice. If I were to pick one word out of the entire Bible that could sum up the gospel of Jesus Christ, it would be this one word, propitiation. Because it is that loaded with theological meaning. This word, more than any other word, demonstrates the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of God's love for us, and it shows how far God was willing to go to save us. Now, at the beginning of the sermon, I asked you a question. How do you know that God loves you? The answer to that question, according to our passage, is propitiation. And a propitiation is simply this. A sacrifice that exhausts the wrath of God. It is a sacrifice that exhausts the wrath of God. It is a term that explains what Jesus accomplished by dying on the cross for us. Now, the wrath of God is his, his rightful anger toward sin. The prophet Nahum, in Nahum chapter 1, 2 and 6, said, The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord keeps wrath for his enemies. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. We were enemies of God because of our sin. And according to Nahum, God pours out his anger, his wrath on his enemies. Do you remember the Garden of Gethsemane where the place that Jesus went to pray before he was arrested and crucified, when Jesus was in that garden, he prayed this to the Father. 
My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And shortly after that, when Jesus was arrested, he said this to Peter. Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given to me? Well, what was in this cup that Jesus was praying about? The Old Testament talks about this cup often, and it is filled with the wrath or the anger of God. Jeremiah 25, 15 says, God says, take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath. The prophet Isaiah talks about the cup of wrath in Isaiah 51 when he says, Wake yourself, wake yourself, you who have drunk from the cup of his wrath. And then the New Testament, of course, also speaks of the cup of wrath. Revelation 14, 9 and 10, in absolutely dreadful language, looks to the future coming of God's wrath and says this, And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath. <clears throat> Poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the Lamb. So we know that the cup is filled with wrath, but why is it filled with wrath? Why does God's wrath even exist? And here's how the Bible answers that question. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then likewise, Romans 3.23 says, for, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. Everybody is godless and wicked in the eyes of God, apart from his saving and sanctifying grace. Our sin may seem small and insignificant to us, but even one sin is an assault on the majesty of God and is worthy of his wrath. All sin is evil, and God in his goodness hates sin. So here's the all-important question. We just learned that God is love. So then why is he angry or wrathful at my sin? Why doesn't he just forgive and forget? Well, God has many attributes. Such, such as love and perfection and goodness and holiness and righteousness. And these all complement one another. They never contradict each other. So it's, it's not as if God ceases to be loving when he is being holy or righteous. Because God is holy and righteous, he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. How can God be both loving and wrathful? The answer is that God is wrathful because he is loving. Theologian Miroslav Vol, he just sounds like a theologian, doesn't he? He says this in regards to this question about God's wrath and his love. I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love. And God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of war in former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed. 
and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of this past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandparently fashion? By refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think, that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. Let me take that story and make it personal. If somebody were to intentionally harm somebody that you greatly cared about, would you want the, ju- the judge at that courthouse to be angry and just, meaning that they do what is right and give them their rightful sentence? Or would you want the judge to just say, hey, I'm a very loving person. I know you messed up, but just go free. The most loving thing that, gu- that judge could do is to provide the punishment that the crime deserves. How much more than will the righteous judge of all the earth do what is right and good? Now the cross of Jesus Christ is the place where God's love and his justice come together and perfectly meet one another. Jesus left heaven to be born as a man. He was our substitute. He lived a perfect, loving, sinless life on our behalf. And then he willingly went to the cross where he would sacrifice himself in our place. Receiving the wrath of God on our behalf. He drank the cup of wrath that we deserve. Exhausting it. Drinking every single drop that was in it. And he then flipped that cup over and exclaimed, it is finished. That is propitiation. That is the gospel. For those who trust in Jesus, there's not a single drop of wrath in that cup. There is no fear of condemnation, for Christ has received our punishment for us. Praise God for that. Now, lastly, we see that God perfects love. There is a great reason that John chose to talk about the love of God right in the middle of a passage that is actually about the church loving one another. John is telling the church to live day by day as those born of God, as those who know God, and as those who have experienced the amazing love of God through the sacrifice of his son. And this isn't something that should just be paid lip service. This love for one another is to be shown in action. And that's why just a chapter before we hear John say this, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. You are called to demonstrate your love for one another by a sacrificial giving that is shown in actions and in truth. And after all, God's spirit now resides in you. And this is a natural overflow of the love that God has already lavished onto you, what he's given to you, flows out to one another. 
Now let me provide just a few examples from Scripture of what loving one another can look like. And this is just a few. Serve one another with humility. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and then told them to do likewise, which was a call to humbly serve one another in love. Pray for one another. Carry each other's burdens. Encourage one another to pursue Christ more faithfully. Confess your sins to one another. Comfort one another. Admonish one another. Gently and lovingly point out sinful habits to one another. Be quick to forgive one another. Listen to Jesus' words from John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in the chapter right before that, John 13, 34 and 35, it tells us what that commandment is. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus essentially says this, if you love me, love my people. And if you love my people, the world will know that you love me. Lastly, verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. This is great because this verse indicates that God himself abides in us. Why mention that nobody has seen God? At first glance, that might seem like a, a, a weird phrase to put in this section, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Since God is not physically in the world, others will see God through the lives of those who demonstrate his love. And who demonstrates his love to others? Those whom God abides in. God abides in us by the Holy Spirit, and it is he who is making us, his children, to be more and more like Jesus. Theologian Danny Aiken says the following about this verse. John makes his point by, by stating that when we love one another, it is proof that God abides in us continually, and his love is perfected or brought to complete maturity. It reaches its intended goal. So God is perfecting our love for one another by maturing our love for one another through the power of the Holy Spirit. In review, we saw that God defines love because God is love. God reveals love in sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God perfects love by abiding in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. He helps you to carry out love for one another. God's love is giving. It's sacrificial. He demonstrates his love for us in sending Jesus. Making Baptist, you also ought to love one another in a giving and sacrificial manner. And I encourage you all to consider ways that you can do that more and more. Just as Steve's love for the Dallas Cowboys was proven through his actions, may your love for one another likewise be proven by your actions. Or to say that biblically, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. If you are here today and have not trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I, I want to extend an invitation to you right this moment. As you heard from the passage today, if you trust in Jesus alone for your salvation, you will be forgiven of all your sins. He takes all of the wrath that you deserve. And this is the only way of escaping the wrath 
There is no other way. Jesus paid the penalty for your sins so that you can have life instead of death. And I urge you to choose life. Church, would you pray with me? Lord, we praise you for your word. Thank you so much for showing us what it is to be loved. And Lord, I pray that you would help all of us to grow in our love for one another. Lord, we praise you for sending your son to take away the wrath that we deserve. We thank you that now we are reconciled to you and we know that we will be with you today and forevermore, praising your name as you rightly deserve. Thank you so much, Lord. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.